All right, y'all ready? All right, great bye week. Um, the goal was to get better, get healthy, and get ahead on Georgia. I think we accomplished that goal. Had a really good practice last night um, in shells and uh, got our guys back into the mindset of, of preparing for the challenge ahead. Um, and it is going to be a very difficult challenge. You know, I don't think Coach Smart gets nearly enough credit for the job that he's done at the University of Georgia. I mean, two national titles, played in five of the last six uh, SEC championships. He's got the best record in the first 100 games in the SEC. Um, you know, I think he's chasing uh, or they're chasing something that's only been done by USC and Miami, which would be a three-time national champion um, and has 20 consecutive weeks at, at number one. You know, it's really surprising to me that he's never won a National Coach of the Year award. I think, um, you know, the assumption is that things just happen easily at that university, and I think he's come in and done an outstanding job of not only recruiting, but recruiting at an elite level and then developing those players uh, to play at an elite level. You know, uh, Coach Saban talks about all the time, but winning creates its own set of challenges. and, and um, you know, this year they've overcome a lot of challenges. They've replaced a lot of talent. I think they're playing at a really high level. I think Coach Smart and his staff have done probably the best job they've done uh, since they've been there to be in the situation that they're in currently now. You know, Coach also has a strong history of developing his assistant coaches. I think he's got a pretty strong uh, head coaching tree. Obviously, two of them are in this league with us that worked for Coach Smart, and one of them is currently um, the head coach at Oregon, and certainly there's others out there that I've missed. You know, he's got a really strong group of assistant coaches. I think you could argue that both of his coordinators could be up for the Broyles Award. You know, I think they do an outstanding job, technique and fundamentals, and playing hard. Um, specifically on special teams, um, they're extremely sound. Um, they don't beat themselves, and now they also create momentum plays. Obviously, last year, the fake field goal um, before half created uh, momentum for them that carried carried them on into their second half run. Um, obviously, I think the blocked punt in the Florida game uh, was a tide changer for that game. Um, so they're certainly more than capable of just playing sound on special teams, but also creating huge momentum plays. Offensively, I, you know, they're, they're top 10 in every major statistical category uh, on the offensive side of the ball. I think Coach Bobo has done an outstanding job of being extremely balanced. He utilizes all of his playmakers. They all receive the football in a lot of different ways. I mean, even with the loss of uh, the outstanding tight end, um, you know, they were extremely balanced and distributed the ball all over the football field uh, against Florida. I think he has his quarterback playing at a, a very high level. I mean, if you didn't know any better, you would think uh, he was playing with Matthew Stafford or Aaron Murray again. Um, it reminds you of when Coach Bobo was coordinating early in the 2000s there. Um, you can tell the quarterback, uh, uh, Carson Beck, since the Auburn game, has taken his game to a new level. I think it's a level of confidence and, that was created in being able to win on this league in the road or on the road. Um, he's very accurate with the football, knows exactly where it's going, um, gets the ball out right around 2.1 seconds, so he doesn't hold on to the ball, which tells you that he knows how to read coverages, knows the concepts, and is confident in the concept. O-line is extremely physical, starts with the run game. They do a great job of protecting the quarterback, but also establishing the run. Um, and there's just not a lot of weaknesses on the offensive side of the ball. Defensively, um, certainly, you know, seventh in the country in scoring defense, sixth in the country in total defense, top 10 in the country in rush defense, top 10 in the country in pass defense, number one in third down defense. You know, the one area they struggle with is red zone defense. But you know why? Because nobody gets down in the red zone. So there's only been like five trips. So, you know, they're certainly very good um, on the defensive side of the ball. I think, you know, Coach um, um, has done a, an unbelievable job of adding new wrinkles. Um, they're, they're, they have new wrinkles from what they've done in the past. I think Glenn Schumann um, has created his own identity over there. Um, and, and has certainly created some havoc plays on defense, but they do a really nice job disguising what they're going to do. They have elite players in all three phases, or all three levels, I mean, not, not just phases, but all three levels, whether it's D-line, linebackers, or in the secondary. 
Um, and they don't have a whole lot of busts. It's not like there's guys running open or a lot of weak points on the defensive side of the ball. So that obviously creates a unique challenge. For Mizzou, you know, we need to focus not so much on the external challenges uh, that this team poses, but we really need to focus on what we can control, which is our play, our execution, our fundamentals, um, and execute the plan um, the very best that we can. And we need to ignore the noise this week, um, focus on the things that we can control. And so with that, I'll open it up for questions. Yeah, I think uh, that's exactly what we did. You know, we came back. Everybody was here Sunday night for our family trick or treat uh, kids' night, and I thought that went really well. Um, and everybody who was dinged up, I think, came back. I uh, only saw one green jersey um, in yesterday's practice. We will be without Chad Bailey this week. Uh, I, I say without; he'd be questionable right now. But um, you know, I think we would know more Thursday, so I won't see y'all. Um, but we will put out an injury report. I'd say at best he's questionable right now. Um, was able to go out there and observe yesterday, but uh, not sure exactly where that, that will be. we got to give it more of a, a go today, and, and we'll know. But other than that, I think uh, you know Ennis was good um, and, and looked like he was going to be able to, to play. Marcellus Johnson was moving without a limp, uh, and so that was really good to see. And, Cody Schrader was out of the green jersey for the first time in, I think, six weeks. So that was a real positive for us. In the last couple of years, the five weeks kind of been a time to, to reset with the way the team's been. How has it been different this year? And what kind of differences have you approached the five weeks this year? Yeah, I mean, like I said, our, our goal was first to, uh, you know, uh, get healthy. Uh, and we certainly did that. Um, and, you know, in the past, we really self-scouted a lot, um, which we did spend a day on self-scout, but we spent another day on, on a future opponent and then spent two days on um, getting ahead on Georgia. So it was a little bit different mindset because the, the bye week came so late. Um, we did spend some time developing our younger guys. We had our, our young guys Super Bowl Monday Night Football last night. Um, but, you know, same kind of thought process, but maybe a little bit more focus. We haven't ever spent as much time working on the, the, the next game. Um, so maybe that would be the biggest difference. I think Georgia's, even without Bowers, has nine guys with 100 yards receiving. First of all, what, did you see anything different in their offense without Brock? And, and then what kind of challenge does it present when maybe not one guy, but, but they've got a bunch of guys? Yeah, I mean, certainly when you watch the games in order from the first of the season until now, you see just how elite Brock Bowers is. Um, you know, I don't know that I've ever seen a tight end single-handedly take over a game like he did against Auburn, um, and, and was extremely impressive. Um, and he, he's such a security blanket that they can, you know, on second ten, throw a quick screen out there, and he's going to get eight or nine. Um, you know, I think without him, obviously, Ladd McConkey stepped up. Uh, I think Dominic Lovett ended up being their leading receiver in that game, not enough necessarily from a yardage standpoint, but from a, a catch standpoint. Um, but they have a, certainly have a lot of weapons. Um, and, and whether you're talking about um, Ladd or Rob Thomas, Rob Rob Thomas or uh, Rosemary uh, Jack Saint, I don't know if I'm saying that right, Dominic Lovett, they've got a lot of different players who can um, catch the ball and create opportunities after uh, with the ball in their hands. So they're not lacking in um, weapons. I still think when you watch the game, um, the thing that stands out to me is their ability to consistently run the football and their ability for their quarterback to make solid, sound decisions. I, I think of, I think it was a play uh, going left to right, so that would have been um, second quarter where they, they, Florida tries to bring pressure. He slides three steps to the left, sets his feet, and throws an in cut to Ladd McConkey for a first down, which was a big play and, and uh, was really an impressive play, being able to slide set throw, so to speak, uh, which is one of the trickiest things for a quarterback to do. But the words when it's meant Darius Robinson moving positions, not just what he's done on the field, but kind of the selfless act of that. Uh, Coach Baker praised that last week. Yeah, I mean, I think it embodies kind of the something to prove mentality. Um, you know, from the standpoint of he wanted to prove to his teammates uh, and prove to everybody else that he could come back and get better. 
and then prove it to this team that this was a team worth fighting for and whatever we needed to do as a team to help win football games, we were all willing to do it. And, you know, as a captain, it's easy to say, no, I'm good. I want to focus on my future as a three technique in the NFL. But he said, hey, if this is what helps us win, then I'll do it. And, you know, there's been some frustrating days, obviously, strained his calf in the summer, um, fought through it, you know, had to learn how to kind of play that position, which you can practice it all you want, but until you play in a game, you're not quite sure what the ebbs and flows are. And he's developed into a really consistent player for us at that position and a guy that we all expect to play well and, and needs to play well for us to, to play the level of or play to the standard that, that death row expects. Yeah, you know, I I, um, I remember the crowd being really awesome. I remember us playing uh, pretty well in the first half. Uh, I remember us not finishing uh, in the red zone, which ultimately cost us an opportunity to win the game. I remember some self-inflicted penalties, but uh, I'm not, not disagreeing with D-Rob. Um, there's certainly a lot of things that we can control and, and do better. But that was a, a really good football team last year, led by an excellent quarterback who played well in the fourth quarter, and we just weren't able to match it. Um, but I don't really take anything from last year's game. That we're two totally different teams. Um, they have a lot of different players on both sides of the ball, um, and we have a lot of different players um, and different identities on both sides of the ball. This is a, a new matchup, um, um, so I, I really don't take much from it at all. What do you take away from the fast start versus LSU and not the great finish, but then the slow start versus Yeah, I wish we, we, we need to put them together. You know, we need to put them together in order to, to find the success that we want. Um, but, you know, it's not a beauty contest. It's a football game, and it's never going to be per perfect. It's about finding ways to win. Um, and there's going to be ebbs and flows in every game. Um, and so you got to withstand the storms, and you got to find a way to to finish, no matter what you you know, no matter how you start. You talk about ignoring all the noise. Do you address with your team how to kind of forget about everything that might be at stake in this game, or do you just try to you know let that that not be something you even bring up to them? I don't think you can ignore anything this day and age because uh, it's just like putting your head, head in the sand. But, you know, I talked to him um, really on Tuesday of last week about um, irregardless after the game, it's not anything that we can control, but there's going to be two different narratives. Um, the narrative is, is going to be if we lost, the season's over and there's nothing left to play for because of what was at stake in the game, which we know is not true. And if we win, we're going to be assumed that we're going to win the East, which is not true because we still have three games left versus SEC opponents. And so irregardless of the outcome of the game, um, the job of the media and social media is to create narratives. Our job is to ignore them and try to be 1-0. and And, um, you know, what's at stake at this game is no different than what was at stake when we played at Vandy, at Kentucky, um, at home versus South Carolina. If you don't play well in those games or you lose those games, then you lose any other opportunities. So to try to say that this one is bigger than those, I think is um, not what 1-0 means. Yeah, that was coach speak. No, OK, go ahead. I wasn't speaking of the red zone. But you're asking about the red zone. OK, cool. Yep, go ahead. Well, I think red zone scoring is extremely important. It's something that we've identified as on both sides of the ball that could be the difference in um, the seasons that we've had the previous two years or the season that we're trying to put together this year. Um, so it, it, it's going to be important to finish drives. Um, you know, when you get inside the 20 on offense, you have to get points. But um, touchdowns are better than field goals. And defensively, when they get in there, obviously third downs are what we call four-point plays, which means they either settle for for three or they get an opportunity to get seven. So um, yeah, it's going to be very important, right, on both sides of the ball. I think you could look at this game 
um, as a third down red zone game. You know, I think when we look at the statistics um, after the game, we're going to look who took advantage of the red zone opportunities um, and who uh, had the best or who did the best job on third downs. Well, it, it, it always starts with good players, and they have good players who have been developed in that system. You know, we were watching the 2021 game um, just to see what style of defense they played against us then, too. And uh, both linebackers played in that game quite a bit, um, uh, number 10 and number two. You know, and actually all the starting defensive line there um, – Chaz, Nazir, Warren, and Tramel all played in that game the entire second half. So they have a lot of continuity um, in the playing and within the scheme. You know, I think Glenn does a really good job of multiple fronts. Um, they, they play a lot of different variations of odd front defense, but then we'll get in some four-man spacing. They do a lot of what's been popular called simulated pressures, meaning they'll um, bring their internal linebackers to create uh, uh, run blitzes to try to cut the defense in half, and then they drop a, a, either a field or boundary in into coverage to try to make sure that they're not short into what would be called hot zones. Um, you know, and then he's done a really good job of uh, Coach Saban runs a lot of three match, um, but their variation is not as much with a with a post safety. They play more of a two safety disguise with it. Um, now they do get in some one, you know, single high safety too, but uh, they've got um, some uniqueness going all the way back to seeing, you know, how they defended us with, with uh, Coach Lanning as the defensive coordinator in, in um, 20 and 21, and then seeing how Glenn has evolved. You know, they've all kind of put their own little fingerprint on it. So they still have some match principles in the coverage, but I think the more simulated pressures, variance of fronts has been something that's uh, unique to them or unique to Glenn. Coach Smart talked about the different ways they defend the slot. I mean, what have you seen from that defense? Is it bracketing? Is it, man, what are the stuff they do to you know, take away some of those options at the slot? I think one of the things that is very um, – unique about Georgia and what they do defensively is the amount of tools they have in their toolbox um, to defend really any position. And you can tell that they have the ability to um, bracket, um, play with a whole player in their man, so play outside leverage, and then force, the, you, know, force you to think that you can go to the inside and they have a, a, a rat or a whole player there. Um, they play a, a version of two match or two man. Um, so they have a lot of variations, and then they have the ability to normally defend the box runs with light personnel, meaning that they're not out, you know, they don't outnumber you in the box, which is, you know, our ability to throw the ball has been created because we have been able to form, format formations to get you into a run stopping defense. These guys really don't care. They just, they just let those big, big guys up front handle it. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest. Like, I'm not trying to, with our team, focus on, oh, man, in this game you got to do this. Like, again, when I talked about our opening statement, we're focused on what we need to do to be 1-0. and In every week, we're focused on ball security, um, red zone third down execution on defense. We're focused on making sure we can be gap sound, stopping the run, fo focus on takeaways and tackling in situational football. Whether it's playing at Georgia or playing at Vanderbilt or playing at home versus uh, South Dakota, like that's the formula that it takes to win. So it's not like you can go in there and say, "All right, guys, all that other, all these previous games, I know we said it, but we didn't mean it. But this game, we really mean you got to force takeaways. Like that ain't that ain't how this works. Like you got to play your game. You know, you know we're going to try to force takeaways. They're not going to try to give them to us. Uh, so. Really, in these kind of games, in these style of games, it usually comes down to little details and fundamentals that you practice over and over again um, that you got to execute. Anything else, Coach? 
Eli and Nudge kind of had an opportunity to assess kind of the first, first several weeks. What areas are you looking to improve on specifically as you go into Georgia? Defensively, our tackling hasn't been where we want it to be, especially in the open field. I don't think our tracking angles, we've been overrunning plays from the inside out. Um, we need to do a better job there. I think our eyes um, in, in um, man-to-man -man coverage, not only our eye discipline, but also the way we're playing our catch technique has to improve. Um, you know, on the offensive side of the ball, I don't think we've been particularly good on third downs. We've avoided them, but you're going to have to execute third downs. Uh, specifically in these next four, in the month of November, you're going to be in some third downs, and we've got to be better not only in protection, but in um, in scheme. So, you know, those are some things that we said, hey, we, we've got to look into and see how do we improve those. Um, and we spent a better part of Tuesday offensively on that. Um, defensively was working on next opponent, which was going to require some man-to-man. -man, so we were able to tie into that. And then uh, every day last week, we worked on some team drills that were focused on tackling angles and ball security. And uh, we repeated those last night. And, and uh, We've got one again tomorrow. Now you guys, all offseason, talked about the offensive line, you know, needing needing to be better than it was last year. How much has that group improved, and do you think that's been recognized at, at the level it, it, it should be, considering how they played this year? Um, I no, I mean, I I think you're a hundred percent right in the fact that the the improvement of our overall offense can be directly tied to the improvement of the offensive line play, whether that's been our ability to run the football <clears throat> or our ability to protect the quarterback. Um, and both of those things have had a direct result in success. Um, and you know, I, I think I've gone up here a lot and, and kind of pounded the table on how big of an, an, an impact Coach Jones has made, um, how proud I am of what Connor Tolleson has continually worked to develop into, I think, Armand Mimbu has got a chance to be a really elite player. I think Xavier Delgado has played himself into draft contention this year at, at, at the left guard position. I think we've always known Javon Foster is a, a very talented left tackle and, and belongs uh, in this league, which means you belong in the next league. Um, so, you know, as far as recognition goes, uh, I'm going to watch what I say, but uh, it, it is what it is. And, and all we can control is what we do Saturday. And if people recognize the performances, um, great. And if they don't, well, that just provides more STP for us. But I think um, our offensive line knows that Cody Schrader and Brady Cook think they're doing a hell of a job. And uh, at the end of the day, that's probably what matters more than whether or not somebody on Twitter recognizes it. Thanks, guys. Thank you all.